Hi, I'm Liam Brown. I manage all the corporate partnerships at Knights Esports Group. Check out knights.gg for more information about my team, and you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented individual. He is not only at the forefront of the esports scene, he is also an executive for the Knights GG group. Gaming is a part of everyone's life in some way, shape, or form, whether it's mobile, whether you're an esport, whether you're a professional, whether you're just a person that wants to relax after the end of the day and play whatever console you play. We are joined by the ever-talented Liam Brown. How are you doing today? Hi, Kurt. Very happy to be here, man. Most esports teams and like tournament organizers have GG anyways as a domain name, so it per works perfectly. See, I'm learning something new every day here. You know, I just play games for fun, but you're you're on, on the scene here. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person in your major field, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to do Geek Stock. Yeah, I'm pretty much a person that had a very unorthodox way of entering in the esports and gaming space. I went in to the world wanting to bring people together and following that passion i fell into esports i didn't come into this wanting to be you know a, a professional player or a content creator or, or even a game designer really I, I came in just wanting to bring people together and i really just followed that passion i just stuck with it and i ended up falling into this role i went to the university of pittsburgh in my senior year I found that I really had a passion for esports and gaming when I found that it was the only COVID compliant form of, you know, entertainment that was still around. It's a D1 school. So a lot of people are used to the, you know, traditional sports such as you know, basketball and, and football. And I went to the games. They were still fun. It's just I found that gaming was a lot more intimate in a setting. And, it, you know, you could have actual conversations like during the entire time. And it was interactive as a form of entertainment. So I found that the city I was based in had the Knights and we had an actual esports team located in uh, Pittsburgh. I still remember this. This was in January. It was on a Thursday. As a Pitt student, I had my ID that could work with the buses and I took the bus down to the offices, which are in the Steelers offices, and there was nobody there. I had my manila envelope with all my hopes and dreams. I had my resume. I had like changed five times. I had my cover letter. I had like rewritten four times and, and like a couple of pit face masks, you know, and, and a white paper addressed to the team and addressed to James O'Connor. And I dropped it off with the one marketing director at the Steelers because she said, hey, they still get their mail. I can put it in there for you. And I, I gingerly handed over my baby, <laughs> for lack of a better term, and, I, and then she uh, put it in the mailbox and I got a call back in a week because it was very different. It was a very weird way of reaching out to a company. Thankfully, you know, they gave me a shot and it's been a wild ride ever since. That's my uh, rant way of, of answering your question. I think one thing that a lot of people don't know is what is esports, not only to you, but what is esports for those that don't know anything about it? No, that's, that's a great question. Esports is really the competitive level of gaming it's really as simple as that term now in esports what makes it different from other uh traditional sports is that the game developers they act as the governing body in each gaming title so like with the nfl they're one of the top governing bodies in football but they can't stop some people from playing football in like the in the park Whereas in esports, the developers can stop anybody. And it stands as a subsect of the larger gaming audience, but it's still growing as an entertainment pathway and really just as a booming industry as a whole. My sh really short way of answering your question is it's a professional level of gaming. Is it easy to get in as not only a player, but is it easy to be an executive? No. <laughs> no, it's not. What I will tell you is that as a growing industry, esports, we require and need more and more new talent. We need people that are going to build the stages. We need coders. We need UI, UX designers. We need marketers, lawyers. But the pathway into esports isn't as clear. Now, there's still a lot of esports organizations. And when I say organizations, I mean either, you know, tournament and events organizers, esports teams, game developers that have specific departments for esports. They want motivated, fresh people with new ideas because in esports as a growing industry, you got to constantly do different things to engage with our audience group. We'll get into like the, the nitty gritty details of the audience segmentation, but they still do post on Indeed and Glassdoor, LinkedIn. 
but a lot of organizations I hear, people that have the biggest success in esports, they have more unorthodox ways of going in. Either they'll port over from being a really high level corporate executive and bringing a lot of those like really raw traditional talents to the organization or sort of an unorthodox pathway like me, you know, and they just consistently were targeting that organization and they knew they wanted to be in the space. As far as easy, I don't believe it's easy. I believe that there's a lot more hoops you got to jump through. But it's just like any any type of job you want to go for. You have to you have to gear yeah. up to it. You have to apply to it. You have to have a different set of skill sets than say back in the 80s or back in the 70s when a lot of these higher level executives that are running companies now have to deal with. Yeah. No, I, I think you put it perfectly. The landscape is changing. There's a growing need for people who can wear multiple hats or have a wider and wider skill set. Like while I work in our partnership side, I also help with content development, team management. I'm on the ground at events. I'm behind the scenes at events. There's some pictures floating around of me like drifting around at, at one of our in-person Valorant tournaments that we hosted. I'm at all levels of this, but in esports, that's not a crazy story to hear. You know, everybody's involved when you have some of these organizations. Now, at some larger organizations, you know, you might be able to hone in on one specific skill set, but it's just like you put it, we need like motivated individuals that are willing to put in that same amount of hustle that they put in to acquiring that job. One thing that I've seen, you see this everywhere, but people put forth the effort to get into that thing. And then once they get into that thing, they coast. Hmm. I believe that if we're going to grow as an industry, we can't have people like that. Look, if you're not motivated and not passionate about the job you want to do, whether you're a player or whether you're an executive, then... Yeah, the, the space doesn't need you. There's other jobs you could do. <laughs> yeah, everybody's got to have that owner's mentality. Yeah. And that's something that's weird to say, but everybody's got to be willing to to hustle at every esports organization that's involved if we're going to uplift the entirety of the industry. That's my little passionate part. <laughs> <laughs> that's my passionate part there. Look, it's great to have passion. You always have to have that when, in whatever you do. I wouldn't still do a show after 15 years if I didn't like talking to amazing people like yourself. So what are some specific qualities you look for when you identify exceptional players for an esports team? Oh man, that's a, that's a great question. So when we're looking at player recruitment, we're mainly looking at like three things. We're looking at skill in the game in question. That's a given. But when we look at some of the other characteristics such as follower count and overall behavior, there has to be some kind of balance. Now, what you can do is you can go in with a brands build championships mentality and like, look, we might not win first prize at every competition that we compete in, but we still want to be a really potent force in the space. We want to place in the top five, the top 10. So skill at the game in question, follower count, because ideally your fans become our fans and their behavior as a person. Are they erratic during interviews? Do they kind of choke up when they're like meeting with their fans? Those are all things to consider. And then bringing them on and making sure they vibe with either the rest of the team or if they compete in certain gaming titles such as, you know, Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, Madden, where they will be their own like entity as a team. they will be one person making sure that they vibe with us as an organization. Technically four characteristics, you know, skill in the game, follower count, behavior, and you know, how much they gel with the organization. Really those four characteristics when we're recruiting professional talent. How do you address and overcome challenges in managing an esports team effectively? That kind of falls into perhaps even crisis management, mm -hmm. like, you know, whether it becomes like player behavior is coming or influence or behavior is coming into question, then it's more of like t the team management role. And we have to like listen to all sides of the story or all sides of the situation. We can make sure that the affected parties are taken care of and making sure that the fans understand where we stand as an organization. I think another bigger challenge just that I face a day to day is promoting or making sure that people understand the value of esports as an investment. Because in my mind, and really when you look at the numbers, esports as an investment stands as a direct channel of communication with the most engaged high income audience on the market right now. You know, that's kind of what the math is showing. It allows for people to interact with the brands that they like in an engaging pathway, whether it's just baseline level, you know, competitive uh, representation with like a team sponsorship or they're like building into the infrastructure of the space like we've seen Red Bull. It's, it's finding those different ways, the diversification it offers to different brands. That's probably my uh, a bigger challenge to me because when I navigate these conversations with people on the corporate side that, oh, my kids play video games or they have no experience in the space. I have to take a step back and I, I just want to make sure that I'm educating them properly. 
hmm. in the right way. So that's probably my biggest challenge. Most people in the executive or, or the corporate space are starting to hear about esports, but they've never done a deep dive. And I'm in charge of doing those deep dives on these like shorter intro calls or in, in the spans of emails or even on places like your show, you know, trying to show the people like, hey, this is what we're dealing with. And then when you have, you know, an audience group and an industry that has hit its like first billion and is on track to hit 1.5 billion in the next few years, they're on track to hit 500 million active participants and viewers in, in the next like three years. It's something that you really can't look away from. I'd say the crisis management as far as like managing talent because sometimes that's like herding cats. You know, I don't know if you ever heard that phrase. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And then on the other side, the day-to-day -day is, is just making sure people understand the value of esports as an investment. Those are my two biggest challenges. And as far as how I really face them is I take a step back and I act as if I'm talking to someone who I just met. Now, as I said earlier, I'm on every level of this. I, I have a couple of Knights jerseys. This is a formal interview. I wanted to wear one of our college shirts, but I have jerseys and I'll wear them out. I'll wear them to the gym or whatever. And I'll get stopped because people see it. And esports jerseys are a little bit more flashy mm -hmm. than traditional sports jerseys because they have to stick out. I'll get people who ask me and I'll get wide eyed kids who are like, wow, what's that? You know, and I have to explain, I go back to some of those scenarios in my head of this person doesn't know anything. They had the confidence to ask me these questions. They have the confidence to take a call with me and respond to my emails. Now I want to make their time worth it. I just go back to that. And it's fun for me because I love looking at the expressions these people make. You know, I talk about either the data or like I talk about some of the cool stuff we're able to do and it's still fun. So navigating these challenges is still a lot of fun for me. Don't get me wrong, but, but that, that's usually how I navigate it. Everyone's an educator in some way, shape or form, we, especially when you have to talk to different levels and skill sets and like that. I was in IT for 20 years, so I had many different levels of knowledge bases that I had to deal with. So I'm glad that you're using your platform and your expertise and you're sharing knowledge and education with those that are asking. And that's the best thing for a growing brand and a growing company. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kurt. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about brands and esports. What strategies have you achieved to gain a balance between both getting brands to support esports and the esports in itself? I think that because of the model the Knights have, it's very advantageous for us when we approach different discussions with brands. So the two usual models you see is either we're going to be fielding competitive teams and influencers, and that usually starts back with, hey, you know, a couple of me and my friends were really good at Call of Duty. So we're going to like go on Canva. We're going to make ourselves a team logo and we're going to slap that on. We're going to start competing to get some notoriety and then we'll bring more teams and more influencers under our belt and make cool videos and cool content for people to watch. Then after that, we'll start to bring in some corporate guys to start managing the money and stuff like that. And that's how some of these organizations go. And they will specialize in competitive teams and influencers. Or you'll also see events and tournament organizers who are like, look, we had the broadcast abilities and we have the technology available to put on these, these tournaments and there's no latency and we can make sure that the, these people will have a cool place to report to at the end for the championships and it'll be a really cool spectacle. We have both. The Knights, there's technically three columns to our organization where on the first column, it's going to be the Knights entity that has the competitive teams and has the influencers. Then the second column is going to be Knights Arena. Now, if anybody's watching at home, I'd, I'd encourage you to look up Knights Arena. That's our virtual home stadium. And that's our entire events and tournaments and leagues management events arm of our organization. In it, we're the number one events and tournaments organizer for Riot Games for Valorant in all of North America. We also run competitive events, all for prizing for Apex Legends and Rocket League. You know, we've also done Halo and, and CSGO, Rainbow Six, Gears of War. Then on the third column of our organization, we're a tech developer and creating new, interesting esports success technologies in platforms like Discord. So the model we have is very different than other organizations. So when I go into some of these conversations with brands, I discuss our advantage, like this is the value of the space. Now, this is how I'm going to put you at every level of the experience. So instead of just small pockets of like, oh, some you know influencer shout outs or some influencer content, or maybe one event here or there, I can make it look like a very natural progression into this space so that the audience feels like this brand has their best interests in mind. 
And so that they might be getting the targeted ads on social media. Okay, I can ignore those. But then they start to see it in the content. They start to see it in the streamers that they watch. They start seeing it in the events. Hey, I really like Valorant. I'm going to look up what current Valorant stuff is going on. Oh my God, the Challengers League. I can see that this brand is a part of this. And oh my gosh, in the Twitch chat, I can see that they've got a discount code just for me because I'm watching this. And that's really how I try to go into those conversations. I talk about the spectacle and the space itself. And then I say, by working with us, you will have more advantages at your disposal than other organizations that dip their toes in with one team sponsorship or something like that. That's usually how I, I navigate those. I play games for fun. I'm a casual gamer. I've done PvP myself, but I'm not good. So hearing the business side of things, because I, I know this is a billion dollar industry. I know this is a huge industry. I see the Twitch streamers and I see everything like that uh, yeah. when it comes to the esports. And I see the clips in, in the shorts feeds of YouTube. So that level of skill is, is amazing and incredible. Can I do that? No, I, I, I've given up that long time ago, <laughs> but I can enjoy other people that are, are at that high level of entertainment. Yeah. And once you start to look at the skills necessary to be a avid competitive player, you know, these guys are burning more calories. It's insane. The brain activity on these guys is like three to five times that of, of like a ch chess player. They're burning more calories and engaging the same physical preparation as professional, uh, traditional sports players. They're making sure that their cognitive ability is at the maximum. So you got the teams investing in dietitian, professional chefs and gym memberships and professional trainers, making sure that they're at their best level in all aspects of the game. So when you start to look at that and then you look at the prize money involved in some of these in multiple events throughout the year, it really starts to take the spectacle. So that's why a lot of people want to be a part of that. And it all starts down at the basics. Let's look at the game that you're trying to play, look at the skills necessary for the game, and then let's like master each of these as we go along and work on them. Actually, that's what I'd like to get into is the games itself. The Knights themselves, you, you mentioned Valorant, you mentioned Rocket League, you mentioned Apex as well. Mm -hmm. Based on, on what you just described in terms of getting a player ready, how do you as an executive get ready for those types of tournaments in terms of managing <laughs> the Knights teams? I make sure I have all of the graphics ready. I make sure like a week or three weeks in advance, all of the graphics and all of the links are working and make sure that when people click on the links, like during the events, it gets actually going to take them to the right page. And then I always make sure I stay tuned for the day of, I'll watch like 10 minutes into the event and I'll take the link and I'll send it to the brand that it's a part of, hmm. you know, so that they can see it. That, that's how I get ready. <laughs> Uh, and also, if it's in person, I'll make sure that I'm sending invites out to people who I want to see it, whether they're like in the corporate side or in our space. And I'll, I'll make sure I'm like, hey, look, just inviting you. You can come check this out. I think you'll love it. Yeah, that's usually how I prep for advance. And then when I'm actually at the event, it's it's usually more of a chill time. You know, it's, it's so weird the people I've met because of the network that this company has. Our strategic partners are the Steelers. Pirates and Wiz Khalif and his Taylor gang. Nice. So I've met some of these professional athletes and some rappers. And this is my bragging segment, by the way, yeah, if anybody's, no, for anybody watching. <laughs> we'll we'll but focus in on you. So you there's a, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. There, there was also this weird set. Like I've hung out with Ludwig. For those of you who <laughs> at home who, yeah. who know CSGO, like Ludwig is the guy when it comes to esports. I just like hung out with him a couple times. It's like the weirdest. It, it, it's not weird. It's not weird. I shouldn't. Huh. Like, I just, like, that was cool. Like, but that was like a regular guy and he was really nice. And I've met like different professional, like football players where I just have to like hold a conversation and just like hang out with them while we're getting stuff set up for a show match that we're doing with our Madden player. So that, that's the end of my bragging segment. The how I prep for events, I make sure everything's working first. Bragging rights are always fun to have. And, and fam meeting famous people is just as amazing too. You can say on, on your deathbed, yeah, I, I hang out with Ludwig. Who's Ludwig? And I'm like, ah, oh, <laughs> crap, wait. <laughs> I, for, I forgot I'm old now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, we do we we do esports in VR now. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it's it's hooked into my brainstem. Like, what God's <laughs> no. <laughs> Beyond win loss records, how do you evaluate the overall success and performance of your Knights esports team? It's got to be that the fans were taken care of and that that cool experience was provided. There's a book out there called Brands Win Championships, mm -hmm. and it talks all about how you don't have to be the best team as far as skill goes. 
if you make sure that the brand under the team gives people a sense of belonging, makes them feel connected with other people, then you'll win. You'll win in the end because you're going to last the competition of just competitive play. That's one thing that I look at, especially with Knights Arena. The Knights really stand for obviously bringing people together, but making sure that the path to pro environment is there so that everybody has a chance to go chase their dreams if they want to be a competitive player. It's like, okay, well, listen, you get your team in order, you come to challengers or you come into the events on our website and you come in and you can actually try, you can do this if you want to. That's something that I really think is is just amazing. That's usually how I try to like go into that kind of line of questioning because I'm just like, this is what the organization stands for. And when we take a look at what the organization stands for and the branding underneath that and what it provides for the people, that's usually how we'll, we'll go about that. And so then it becomes, oh, okay, it's not just about winning every time. It's about making sure that people are taken care of. And I, and I really like that. You know, for aspiring esports executives, because you, you didn't stumble into this, you wanted to do this as a career. What advice do you have for those that are trying to seek a journey into leadership for this industry? It starts at, at the grassroots level. If you want to pursue leadership, then take into account what you need to do to pursue that leadership. So, you know, I, I sometimes I go back to the example of, of John O. He's our CFO, and he got his start organizing collegiate events on behalf of Blizzard at his college. It doesn't have to be at that same level, but it could be like at the smaller level than, than even that. Like, Let's say that you want to get into the space. Okay, well, there's a bunch of free resources available to you. Reddit and also Eventbrite. You can go on those and start to lead and organize your own events in gaming. Maybe you want to get like a couple of friends together for Halo, but you don't have any friends. You can start to go on the different communication pathways and social media networks to develop those kinds of friendships. There's a lot of free resources available to also build the skill set necessary to back up your leadership. You know, I would definitely encourage people to go after either computer science or, and coding or you know marketing and, and all these other free kinds of trainings that exist out there. And then I would use that to better organize people. And then once you have like the pedigree to kind of back up like, hey, I put on these events, I led these different projects, then you can kind of go in expecting like either a leadership position or something of that nature in esports or really in anything. And I would also say that saying yes and the combination of that with showing up every time and being consistent in that, that will lead you down that positive pathway uh, into things and really breaking out of your comfort zone and taking on projects and responsibilities that make you grow as a person. There's been plenty of times, like even at the nights or, or even pre previously, like I could have said no or I could have coasted at certain points, but I didn't. I said, okay, I could have been the guy who just sat in the corner of the meeting and just like didn't say anything. But if I saw problems, I would choose to voice them and, and, and I would go out and be like, hey, you know, these are some things we could try, not knowing if the, it's going to be accepted by the audience that I'm saying it to. But it, it either did or it didn't, you know, but I took that chance. Breaking out of your comfort zone, organizing, showing up is probably the, the three words of advice that I would give to somebody who, who's like going through that. Whenever, I, whenever people ask me like for advice and stuff like that, I give it more of like, not even sugar kind of just make it seem like more formal and, and stuff like that. I just kind of like talk like me. So when, when I say stuff like this, I'm like watching it after. I'm like, oh, I could have I could have said that better. <laughs> <laughs> I could have been like a guidance counselor there, but I didn't, you know, <laughs> but whatever. You know, that, that's my advice for people like that. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Oh, man. It's, it's got to be the – man, that's a tough one. I think it's got to be like there's so many people out there that want to uh, conquer fear. Conquer fear has got to be the second best because – People instantly go to like comic books and stuff like that when they think of that example, which is just a personification of that phrase. It's like, okay, well, I have to be like Batman. I have to jump off this cliff or facing down like three people in an alleyway and it's just me and my arm's broken. It's not like that. It, it starts at the smaller level. It's like, am I afraid to raise my hand in class for fear of judgment that I might get this thing wrong? Am I afraid to wear this jacket or this shirt going into a public setting because I'm afraid people will stare and make fun of me? Am I afraid to go after this? position because I think I don't meet all of the qualifications. Am I afraid to go talk to these people who I think I could be friends with because I saw them also playing the same game or talking about the same thing? 
And I think when it starts at those little things, you start to become a stronger and better version of yourself. This is coming from the guy who did sit in the corner of classroom and I was really afraid of asking questions in the middle of class or I was really scared of talking to people. And I say that because not as like, wow, look where I've come from. I just say that as that advice is something that I didn't realize until very recently. Some of the more extroverted things or actions I might take on a day-to-day basis started relatively recently when I realized that the repercussions for either being true to yourself or trying to bring your own good energy into the world or into different spaces that you are trying to be a part of, there is really no repercussions for that. The worst they can say is, here's the thing, people are a lot more awkward than you think they are. So if you talk to them and they're not interested, they're just going to like kind of dip away. You know, they're not going to like scream at you. They're not going to, you know, face fear and it'll start in small, more calculated steps. That's probably the best part. (laughs) That's good. We talked about uh, branding. We talked about social media and we talked about that type of social landscape and it's ever changing every day, every year. How do you see the role of gaming and esports evolving as a means for social interaction and entertainment? I think that there's more and more games coming out that offer that tailored experience to to anybody. There's 10 million different first person shooters out in the market. There's a lot of different uh, experiences available to the consumer now. And I think that in esports, as the space evolves, it's going to provide more and more spaces for people who aren't finding those in real life. What I'd like to see the space evolve to is more in-person stuff or more stuff that allows people to break out of that comfort zone that they might be feeling and make new friends. That's my biggest passion, you know, making sure that people have the platforms necessary to make friends. And I think esports is headed in that direction, especially with technologies like Discord or different communities like, you know, on Reddits or, and subreddits. And you look at Steam and there's constantly cool new games coming out where people can try and get in with like the different fan bases there. So I think as far as where the space is headed, I think that it'll further bring more people together. And give people a new sense of entertainment when they might not enjoy watching uh, stuff that other people enjoy watching, like concerts. You know, some people might not like the concerts in their area, but they might go to a lot of the esports events in their area. Well, they might not like going to all the football games. They might, but they might like going to these different gaming events. And I think that just providing experiences for people and establishing friend groups is, is where esports is headed. That's my hope <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Based off of the technology that's present. Should be fun in the in the five, ten years when with the whole <laughs> AI VR aspect that's coming out with a lot of this technology. So And especially with, you know, the link of voice chat and how Discord is now linking with so many different services. So that it's kind of like that cool uninterrupted experience that you can like play with your friends and you can also engage with your friends in all different aspects, like with Discord, their API, linking it with different services and stuff like that. I think that's like really cool. That's my hope (laughs) as the loner tortured soul. No, I was kidding. (laughs) How do you approach and identify and outreach to potential corporate partners for the Knight Esports group? Oh man, that's a great question. So what, what I like to look at is companies that are going after our audience in any aspect. So 18 to 35, high income, more educated, and they use esports or gaming content as their main uh, viewing pleasure. Oh, and also tech savvy, to put it very plainly. When I see people trying to penetrate this space, I usually will go after the specific members of their corporate staff who are open to new possibilities and they're open to you know diversification of their outreach to this audience. And then I'll go out to them and and explain just like I did. Hey, the team that I work for and the services we provide, we can offer you a direct line of communication to this audience group that I know you're looking for. Whether they're receptive to that or not, it kind of is how I phrase my information or the frequency of communication. So making sure that not like, you know, annoying them, but pleasantly persistent and making sure that they understand, hey, if you don't want to be a part of this opportunity, you don't want to be a part of the future, that's fine say it. And I don't mean that in a confrontational way, but I don't mean that at all. But like, you know, it's fine. Just, you know, let me know if this is the right fit. I'll link them stuff that their competition is doing in the space that usually like will get under their skin a little bit. So a lot of it is mainly the, the outreach 
and perhaps even, dare I say, the sales approach to a lot of these, where I'll just say, hey, I am staying up to date in your industry's efforts with this audience. And I think you guys offer something really special and we also offer something really special. So let's work together. That's mainly how I go into those conversations in the beginning. And then after that, it's more so, okay, cool. We went through the whole needs and analysis rigmarole and I understand this and this and this. So, hey, I can go back with my team and we can have something spun up for you in this time frame. And then from there, it's more so the internal politicking of it's a new space. You know, it's a creative we haven't tested out. You know, we've usually spent all of our money on, <laughs> we've usually spent all of our money on meta, you know, like Instagram and TikTok ads, and especially with TikTok shop. Oh my gosh, this is going, you know, I'm saying like, okay, you know, you can ping the audience with ads as much as you want, but how are you creating that engaging experience for them? And how are you truly impacting them so that they feel like you're not just trying to get their money where you can build the brand and again, bring people together under your banner flag. Well, come work with us and, and I can help you establish that. That's usually how the beginning of those conversations go, like to the middle. Then from there, I just got to basically just describe to you the sales process for like any any company ever. But that's, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much like as we go into it, I represent a very unique opportunity and it's phrasing that in such a way that they understand. Do you have a success story where a partnership just really attributed to the Night Sports group? Yeah, I think we worked with a, a group where they ran a giveaway. We had also done, we had done events, creative content, in-person and digital events with them. One of the coolest things that we also did was these custom giveaways of an item that we did together. And in that giveaway, we also did, hey, you can come with us and this brand to the Rocket League World Championships over in Texas. The contest winners would be able to, you know, win two free tickets. They can come sit at box seat the entire time to yourselves. And it was it was really reminiscent of like those Nickelodeon and Disney Channel like sweepstakes for like the cruises and stuff like that. And I loved it. Not just the fact that we got cool content out of it, but also the entries. They ended up becoming warm and hot leads for the brain in question. And all of those people that had entered into the giveaway also ended up purchasing product within two to three months of entering that giveaway because they were interested at first. And then they also became interested in the brand itself, just in like from the giveaway and the combination of that with the other things that we were doing. I usually go back to that as a success story because, hey, even if only two people were to win and they were twin, and then one guy won and his twin brother, he gave his ticket, this his second ticket to his brother. Even though technically two people won for the brand, they also won. And look at all of these like warm and hot leads that we like handed up to you on a silver platter. I get scared of like mentioning like more specifics just because like naming the brand and stuff like that would be like a little bit weird. So the return on investment for what you put together from a corporate standpoint, from a business standpoint, helped out a company in a, in a greater avenue. Yeah. And it made them really stand out from their competition. Exactly. It was awesome. <laughs> for someone who's just starting in the esports scene, what should they focus on as a player? What should they focus on? as an executive? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So, so as a player, take a look at the gaming title or gaming titles you want to compete in and make sure you're consistently putting in effort to grow your skills in the game. And look, that they may seem obvious, but when you see when you see as many people as I've seen who go in thinking like, oh, I could do that, and then they just get swamped like in competition against like amateurs. You know, it's it's pitiful. But you want to make sure that your skill in the game is there. You want to find as many pathways of cool content that you can be posting. And you want to be consistent with that. You want to make sure that you are engaging in practices that favor the algorithm. You want to make sure you're hashtagging all of your posts in the right way and consistently. You want to make sure that you're a part of all of the communication networks in that gaming title. And you can get into as many of those groups as possible. Make sure that you're live streaming as much as possible. Make sure that you're taking the most interesting bits and, and those clips and you're posting those in the spider web connected to other spider webs method that we've seen like other you know content creators post. Like they'll post vertical content on YouTube shorts, TikTok, Instagram reels. Make sure that you have specifically down all the social networks that you're going to be posting on and posting consistently on. And make sure you have the data and analytics down so that you can measure what posts work, what behaviors work for your audience. Make sure that you're doing things for the audience and making sure that the audience has something to latch onto. You know, it's not just your cool logo. You're constantly being engaging with, with the audience. And then from there, once you've kind of established yourself in your 
brand, you know, you've upped the follower count, you've got like a notable amount of skills under your belt, then you can start reaching out to teams on every level. So be a part of different organizations, Discord groups. A lot of esports teams have Discords. If they don't, kind of lacking. Make sure you're part of those. Make sure you're an active follower. You know, make sure you're commenting and liking on under all the posts that, you know, not in a spammy way, but in an authentic way. And then make sure you're consistently following up and messaging saying that, hey, I want to become a player for this team. I saw you guys have this team and I compete in that. Here's my record. Here's my follower count. Here's all my data and analytics talking about like my audience that this is your network at your disposal when I go. If you want to be a competitive player that's part of a team, you can go that route. Or you can also go down the route. There's a lot of different agencies out there uh, for influencers. So once you've like, you know, developed your overall brand, follower count, skill in the games, you know, your persona, you can go to some of these other different influencer agencies and just say, hey, make sure you understand like your rate as well that you would charge for different sponsors to work with you. So you're like, hey, this is what I have to offer. How can we go about doing this? So you can either be your own content creator, just doing your own thing. And there's a lot of people that have success with that. You can go and be a content creator or a player for different esports teams, or you can be a, you know, a streamer or an influencer that is also managed by different agencies. So there's a lot of paths to work on there, but the universal truth is that you have to build the audience, make sure you're consistently posting and your consistent force in the different communities for those games and those um, different social medias that you're a part of. So that's for a player. Now for executive or somebody on the corporate side, I'd make sure that you have your skill set down and try to consistently grow your skill set, whether it's you know taking on different certifications or taking on different projects and accurately describing in your CV what projects you were a part of and making sure that you have a really accurate depiction of all the cool projects you were part of at that brand. Then going into esports, make sure you have that skill set, all of your notes and stuff like that memorized so that when you go into these conversations, you're like, hey, this is the different thing that I bring to your organization. And esports teams, just like traditional sports teams, they don't just hire fans. Don't just expect a job because, oh, you know, you know the player records or you know the team's records. Like, oh, I saw you guys uh, lost this match at this conference in this league. You want to know the overall space and you want to know specifics of a lot of different teams. But don't just hone in on one team you want to work at because, oh, you think that they'll hire you just because you know stuff about them. No, it, it doesn't work like that. So I would definitely increase your skill set. Make sure that when you go into the conversations, you know what projects you're a part of and you know how different you are from other applicants. And make sure that you have questions about the role. I mean, you know, then, then, then it goes into more like the regular job like search advice, it's like make sure you have questions for for that interviewer based on the role. Make sure you're consistently following up with people if you fall out of communication. And you'd be surprised how like those smaller skills add up to a position at the end, even in esports. And also make sure that you're an active member of their communities and you know what's going on. Not like just so you can be a fan, obviously, but just so that you know what's going on and you're able to network your way into different positions. That's my advice for on the corporate side and also on the player side. Now you can clip that into the five minutes and then you can post that. That's how you get a job in esports. You know, that's, that's pretty much it. But yeah, that's how. <laughs> well, that's the hardest part about being a content creator, whether you're on my side of the table or whether you're part of an esports group, because there's so much content that you've collected, I'm sure, over the years and at different events. How do you choose the best content that is going to resonate with your audience, though? Oh, that's a good question. You develop your fan base because they trust kind of your input from the start. So whatever you think is the best, best content, you know, is reflective of your previous posts or your, or your previous, you know, stuff. I think that would probably be the best route to go. And the stuff that didn't quite make the cut, hey, you can put it on a t-shirt and sell it like later, you know, or you can put it in a big B-roll at the end of the year and put it on your Patreon and just say, hey, you know, members of my Patreon can see the biggest bloopers from this year. People do, people eat that up. People love that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I, if I went through all of my past interviews, uh, I'm sure there'd be a lot of content that either would get me sued or would uh, be great humorous bloopers. So, <laughs> I think those are both really good post-worthy things, though. You know, it's just like the more controversial bits or something like that. <laughs> people, people would love that too. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Ooh, probably as a kid realizing that you know words do hurt your feelings. 
it's got to be like the easiest example because from there I understood like, oh, you know, words do hold a lot of power because it made me feel this way. But it also, looking back now, it helped to inspire me to believe and, and be more secure in myself so that would act as a shield when facing some of those, when facing some of those powers that were at work. That's that's my introspective answer there. <laughs> when I was a kid. <laughs> what is the social stigma that is in esports that just needs to go away? Oh my God. The unhealthy, overweight gamer living in his mom's basement that eats pounds of cheese puffs and chugs Mountain Dew. At the professional level of esports, that's not a reality. You look at any professional esports player that's on the top stages, look at their BMI, look at their cardiovascular stamina, look at all those aspects, and you'll find that it's not the reality, at least in esports. Now, I think that's something that needs to change, and I'm in I'm trying to bring the knights and put them as a beacon of health and wellness in the esports space, because I believe we're uniquely suited to begin the shift of mindset and the shift of health into the space. I've met so many good people and friends while gaming and going to the gym. You know, those two subgroups are, are very intertwined at the hip already because they share a lot of the same content because they're, they're playing a lot of the same games together. And they're watching a lot of the same animes together. I think that stigma needs to change for, for esports and, and really gaming as a whole because people are becoming more inspired by these figures like Ghost from Call of Duty or Kratos from God of War. And they want to emulate those same skills, you know, physiques and bodies that they see in the game. And they have all the ability to do it now. There's so many different videos that you can go and learn for free about different exercises you can do to look like these video game characters. And okay, well, I still eat like this. How should I eat? It's like, oh, nutrition basics for, you know, men in their 20s. And it's... Very easy. I think that needs to change. And and I'm trying my my darndest to, to bring more brands into that discussion. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? It's got to be like Travis Kalanick, the guy who created Uber. He, that, that guy let nothing stop him, even legally. He didn't let like politicians decide the fate of something that he knew was going to change the future. He has a very inspiring story. I think that's something that I believe in. I'll take into account the arguments of the naysayers, whether or not they're valid, and, and make sure to assess whether or not they are valid. I just make sure that when I navigate some of those arguments against what I'm doing or the industry that I represent, you know, I understand that they're coming from a lot of different places, but I can't let that stop me from achieving what I want to achieve in this space. Travis Kalanick has got to be definitely up there. We could also go with Alexander the Great because he never lost, and I think that's pretty cool. Obviously, I aspire to that, but you know, probably, probably those two uh, famous figures. From a professional standpoint, you, of course, part of an amazing organization with the Knights, and you are professionally trying to get your team to another level than ever possible. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? No, not yet. I have achieved things that I'm very, very proud of, and I've met really amazing people on the way. And I'm trying to stand as an example for people who don't know what the future holds and they're scared of that. But I feel that there's a lot of things that I want to work on and conquer in the future so that I can become more successful in my eyes and be able to inspire others. And by others, I mean, I have like, I have family members and friends that I want to inspire. Yeah, that's how I, that's, <laughs> that's my hero speech. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Focus on the things I can control. Don't panic about the small things and understand that failure is temporary, but giving up is forever. There's always a way out. There's always things you can do. And by focusing on the things that you can control rather than work, worrying about the things that you can't, I feel that that's one of the best ways to get out of the rut of failure. I can't tell you how many times I've been like in the corner, like stressed about something, but then I get a notepad and I'm going to brag about this because I have a new notepad. <laughs> you, get a, you get your notepad and you just start writing down the things that you can control about your current situation. All the stress just fades away for me. 
And, I, and I'd encourage anybody who is in perhaps the rut of failure uh, or is experiencing some kind of failure, focusing on the things that they can control as a way to get out. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as an esports player, executive like you are, or maybe something along that path that maybe they don't know about just yet and you're inspiring them towards that. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think by approaching their goals in actionable steps, making sure that they appreciate and understand their successes and where those successes came from. Because you want to be able to inspire others, but more so tell them the steps at which you got there so that you can lift other people up. So by understanding all of the actionable steps that it took to get you to that point, you'll be able to better understand how, how your journey took place and you can tell other people and map out what success can look like for them. And it's not just going to be that same old, same old of, oh, you just need to work hard or, oh, you just need to never give up. No, it's going to take the form of, that's why I gave the examples that I gave when, when becoming a professional player or in the corporate space. I try to give those examples because that's what I've seen work and that's what has worked for me. If your life was a video game, what would its title be? What would its soundtrack be? Oh, man. Well, the soundtrack would be from Daft Punk because I really liked how what they did with the Tron Legacy movie. As bad as that movie was, the soundtrack was amazing. And then as far as the title, oh, my God, I'm trying to not make it sound like some cheesy Hallmark <laughs> like movie title. And I love Hallmark movies, but I'm just trying not to make it sound like I do. <laughs> how about Men Against Mountains? I don't know, because I feel like there's a lot of mountains that we have to climb on our route to the goals that we have for ourselves. And while it is a mountain, there's you know a lot of steps you can take to climb the mountain. I'll, I'll leave it at that before I like dig myself in a hole <laughs> with words. I, God. <laughs> Rapid fire segment four uh, questions from the St. Clair College eSports department. What makes an event stressful as a manager? So there's, there's a lot of things. I, I'm happy to go in, in depth on this. What you want to make sure is that you have everybody's phone numbers saved and make sure that you have multiple ways of reaching out to that person, whether it's phone number, you also have their discord. And that's usually how we navigate our events. Make sure that everybody clearly understands what the weather's going to be like the next day or the days that the event's going on, what traffic is usually like going to that area and what time people are expected to be there. It is best to show up just a little bit early. And I'm not even saying like, oh, 30 minutes. I'm saying just like maybe like two or three minutes early and you're at the doors. Make sure that you have everybody's contact information for the event's venue. Now, if you guys, you know, at, at a college, you guys usually don't have to deal with this. Actually, that's a lie. Sometimes if you can't get into the building in the first place, that's a problem that a lot of people seem to overthink. They don't understand that that's like a simple thing. Make sure you know everybody that's going to be at the events venue. Make sure you know all the maintenance guys. Make sure you know everybody that is going to be overseeing the physical <laughs> infrastructure that is in place. Make sure all of the internet connections and everything like that is all set up. The cable management has to be there. And then we're talking about esports events specifically, but this can also deal with like other events, perhaps that are being live streamed. Make sure that the caster tables and make sure that the screens aren't facing the players make sure that the players can't actually look at what the other teams are doing you know that's that is a problem still in some events make sure that the audience has stuff to do when they're not just watching the action themselves because here's the thing newsflash there's not just going to be consistent action all the time everybody would die from exhaustion okay there we're going to need time in between rounds of play and in between getting some of the players off stage and getting other players on stage make sure that the, the audience has stuff to do that allows for the possibility of, of different sponsors and different brands who want to be a part of this to booth there or provide cool experiences oh my god make sure that food is taken care of a lot of events venues have rules against that you can't bring outside food in or you have to purchase our food hmm. you know yeah <sighs> be really surprised at that make sure there's enough water i can oh my god that's like it, or, that's something that everybody overlooks make sure that everybody has the wi-fi password hmm. Everybody's going to be doing stuff when they're not like like eyes fixed on the screen. Make sure that the group chat is set up so everybody knows what's going on. Make sure that if the run of show has been published before the event and has been dispersed to the team and it's being updated, make sure everybody gets an updated copy. Oh, also, make sure talent shows up. I can't, like, some of these are prima donnas, but, like, you know, it's like, herd, again, herding cats. Like, make sure all the teams that are competing and all the talent that is there, like, make sure they show up. Make sure they know... <laughs> 
What's going on? Oh my god, I make sure all the screens are working. I can't tell you how many times we've had to do last minute monitor like swaps because the monitors weren't working for some reason. Mm. And it could be we just swapped the monitor out. The cables are the same. Okay, that's that's what I have to say about esports events. Yeah. yeah what, okay. Was this more of a therapy session question? No, yes, but no, yeah. <laughs> Favorite video game that distresses you? Oh man. It's gotta be Force yeah. Unleashed. Yeah, Star Wars of Force Unleashed. This and then also the the Transformers games from High Moon Studios. So mm-hmm. Fall of Cybertron and War for Cybertron. Arguably the best Transformers games. Those, hands down, were also like really big for me. It's got to be those. Uh, and then Skyrim with mods. Yes. With mods. You know, not, nothing crazy. You know, I'm not doing like Thomas the Tank Engine and stuff like that. I'm not doing any of that. I'm just doing like texture mods, like more greenery, more animals, more NPCs, graphics reboot. It's got it's to be Skyrim and Star Wars The Force Unleashed. Video game that makes you mad. That's a good one. Got to be the Telltale games. Mm-hmm. And I'm bringing up old games. I understand that. But it's got to be the, some of the Telltale games. Because I feel like I could be nicer or I could be like worse of a person in all of those. I feel like the all the options for dialogue and action, they have like this happy medium with everything. And I'm like, no, what if like that day I want to be mean? Or what if that day I want to be nicer? It's just like, oh, it, the dialogue option would be like, oh, don't worry, I'll save you. And the action is like, oh, don't worry, I'll save you from him. And then you shoot the guy. And it's just like, no, I like, I didn't want that. But uh, yeah, so it's got to be the Telltale games. That's why I got to get Baldur's Gate because then I'll have yeah. like full influence of like everything I'm doing. That can, that like, is that is a rabbit hole. When you go yeah. down, it is going to be crazy. Uh, Mass, yeah. Before Baldur's Gates, though, uh, Mass Effect had a really cool Paragon yes. system with the good and the bad. And when you go bad, I mean. You just go dark side all the way. It's just crazy. Yeah, and I think I, I think the morality system in Baldur's Gate, Mass Effect, and then also Star Wars: The uh, Old Republic mm-hmm. does had pre- those were like pretty good systems. And like I I I dude, this this kind of like dates me, but I remember when X Play was around mm-hmm. and like G Four TV, okay. that was like. You know, you talk about a company that got put out of business from like the internet. Yeah. <laughs> My God, <laughs> their their fall was swift, but. I remember seeing all the stuff that they would do about like Mass Effect and stuff like that. And yeah, it was even, such a cool game title. Even going back farther, well, is Electric Play as well. EP. Yeah. 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 Like that's dating me. <laughs> now, like, oh my God, Game Informer. Remember yeah, Game Informer? Yeah. I used to, yeah, I used to get their magazines like all the time. Dude, I loved Well, once a month, I got the once a month issue. Yeah. Loved it. Um, now it's just IGN rules everything. I want to shoot myself in the head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, dude, I'm like, they're too big. Yeah. And and that's horrible. That's bad of me to say. Of course. I love like Enterprise. I love, you know, but they are huge, man. I remember when they were just like doing some YouTube videos. And now it's like, I don't depend, but like to stay up to date on like some cool games that are coming out, I do look forward to their monthly videos of like, here's some cool games coming out. Mm-hmm. You know? God, I hate to say it. I hate to say it, dude. Who is the best player you've ever seen in any competition you participated in? Oh, man. I got to hand it to just really the whole team of uh, Oxygen Esports because they had come to play at our Knights Forge in-person tournament that we hosted here. And it was the first like officially Riot-sanctioned off-season tournament in all of like North America. So it was like huge to like – be able to host it here locally in Pittsburgh uh, because, you know, no gaming events happen here or like on the East Coast that much. I mean, obviously like Boston, like New York, but their whole team, they just like, they didn't just sweep the competition. They like dominated in like their, their tactics, but they were really calm about it. Their trash talk was not like some of these other teams. Some of these other guys, I thought they were going to like throw hands, which which that's that's how it is. I mean, I understand that's how it is, but it was just like, oh my god, like I, because the audience was getting riled up, and I thought I thought I was going to have to like break a, a notable amount of fights like in the audience alone. But you got to hand it to them because they came in, they won, they were very professional about it, and then you know they took their leave, and they all had abs for some reason. Like a startling, a majority of the Oxygen Esports guys have abs. For for those of you at home, I mean, you can't look this up. I don't think you can look this up. But take note, most of the Oxygen Esports team, they have abs. 
Or their coach, the new Russian guy, he's got like huge arms. It's crazy. Wait, so Russian tactics for North American esports? Uh, just basically, <laughs> we're going like the old school KGB. Yes, yes, exactly. We're getting like we're getting all of the like gritty CS:GO players, and we're just getting them in Valorant again. <laughs> Guys who actually lived through Escape from Tarkov, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is not gulag this is gulag yeah i will show you <laughs> they have like pictures on their like creepy serbian like thick phone it's just like i will show you it's like oh jesus why do you have these photos there are rivalries in esports obviously who are the knights nemesis oh dude we don't have any because of well i would i would definitely say esl and some of the other tournament organizers that's who i would say as, as like a team you know, we we don't have any notable like with the competitive teams we have, we don't have any like notable rivals. But I will say that as an events organizer, we're really battling for supremacy there. That's how I'd answer your question. <laughs> what is the best moment you've seen on a Valorant Apex or Rocket League match that you've hosted? Oh man. It's gotta be when we were concluding the the Challengers League. So obviously it was when the guard won because it was the culmination of the entire Challengers League. And it was just like, wow, we've really saw this to its completion. And this was the first time Challengers was really professionally produced. There was no corruption. So here's here's a little anecdote for you. In Challengers League previously, what a lot of teams would do in the Tier 1 and Tier 2, Challengers is Tier 2, and Tier 1 is obviously the Global League. This is messed up, but it makes sense. Teams would have their roster at the Tier 1 and the Tier 2. They would swap members of the roster so that they always had a team in the conference. If they lost out the Tier 1, oh, don't worry, we got a Tier 2 team. It's messed up that that happened, but it makes sense why it would happen. You know, we did away with that. We started like having different like other teams compete in our league. It was like we had some crazy teams sign up. It was like FaZe Clan and 100 Thieves and like Oxygen and like some of these other guys. And then Disguised Toast and like XQC and, and these other like big gaming streamers started picking up Valorant teams just to compete. So then when it was the conclusion of the Challengers League, we were like, wow, you know, the guard, they came in, they won. That was so cool. You know, the guard and, and M80, they did really well. But what was like the biggest kicker for me, like a few months after when the guard like laid off a bunch of their staff and they were selling the team property, the I think it was like the equity firm or whatever organization owned the guard was selling off the property. So like it was this huge story of like, wow, you know, you won. They also didn't sign the paperwork to compete in the Premier League. That was also a kicker because that's what happens at the end of Challengers. Like you get to the tier one league and you went through Knights Arena. You are now like pros. So yeah, it's got to be when the guard won because the story after also was like a huge kicker. I had encouraged people to look into it. I encourage your students to look into it because it was it's really surprising. Yeah, and it, and dude, it's, it's a really good story of how the outward success of the competitive teams might not be reflective of the internal struggles on the back end of like the internal side of the organization. Well, Liam, I do hate to say it, but that is this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Dude, it was awesome being on here. You know, feel, please feel free if you need like a spot to get filled in, you know, let me know. You had great questions. You know, this was, this was awesome. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is all the social media presence of the Knights? Definitely just check out like knights.gg. All of our social media handles are in the top right corner of the website. If you go and you look through the Instagram and scroll down, I'm in some of the videos. And if you guys want to connect with me, just look up Liam Brown Knights on or just like my job title in LinkedIn. And you'll find me. I'd love to connect with all of you guys that are watching. Yeah, just bring more people to this space. Let's do this. Well, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O. Or go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back after 12 or so years. You can find it at twogeekstalking.podme.com or just search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.